You have Marable Manning's, Manning Marable's book, Malcolm X, Life of Reinvention. It just came out. Marable Manning uh, died just about the same time when it came out. People have been calling this his magnum opus. So this is like the culmination of his life's work. And in this book, we find out that Malcolm X is gay. So, uh, he, Malcolm first returned to New York City and subsequently to Boston, desperately trying to survive through a variety of hustles. It was during this time that Malcolm encountered a man named William Paul Lennon, and the uncertain particulars of the intimate relationship would generate much controversy and speculation in the years following Malcolm's death. Wall, William Paul Lennon was born on March 25, 1888, in Paul Tuckett, Rhode Island, to Bernard and Nellie F. Lennon. His father was a successful merchant and newspaper publisher and active in local Democratic Party politics. The eldest son of eight children, Lennon enrolled in Brown University in 1906 as a special student, uh, described in the school's catalog as a category for mature persons of good character who desire to pursue some special subject and who have had the requisite preliminary training. After attending Brown for several years, Lennon drifted, seeking to establish himself in some suitable profession. During World War I, he served as chief petty officer in the Navy, stationed out of Newport, Rhode Island, and upon his discharge, he lived briefly with his parents before getting hired as a hotel manager in Paul Tuckett. Within five years, he had become manager of Manhattan's Dorset Hotel, just off Fifth Avenue in Midtown. Apparently, embarked, he embarked on a successful career in hotel management, but contrary to Malcolm's later assertions that his patron was a multimillionaire, there is no record indicating that Lennon ever became truly wealthy. Sometime during the 1930s or early 1940s, William Paul Lennon had relocated to Boston where he began to employ male secretaries in his home. Malcolm's initial contact with Lennon may have come through classified advertisements placed in New York newspapers. What is certain is that sometime in 1944 Malcolm had become had begun working for William Paul Lennon as a butler and an occasional house worker at Lennon's Boston home on an affluent stretch of Arlington Street overlooking the public garden. Soon something deeper than an employer-employee relationship developed. After Malcolm's later arrest in 1946, he would give the police Lennon's name and address as a previous employer, convinced that Lennon would use his financial resources and other contacts to help him during his time in prison. The autobiography describes sexual contacts with Lennon, uh, with William Paul Lennon, except that Malcolm falsely attributed him to a character named Ruby, or Rudy, in his autobiography with uh, Alex Haley. So Rudy had a side deal going on. He's quoting out of uh, the autobiography. So Rudy had a side deal going, a hustle that took me right back to the old street steering days in Harlem. Once a week, Rudy went to the home of this old, rich Boston blue blood, pillar of society aristocrat he paid Rudy to undress them both and then pick up the old man like a baby lay him on his bed and stand over him and sprinkle all over sprinkle, sprinkle him all over with talcum powder Rudy said the old man would actually reach his climax from that from ta talcum powder based on circumstantial but strong evidence Malcolm was prob probably describing his own homosexual encounters with Paul Lennon the revelation of his involvement with Lennon produced much speculation about Malcolm's sexual orientation, but the experience appears to have been limited. There's no evidence from his prison record in Massachusetts or from his personal life after 1952 that he was actively homosexual. More credible, perhaps, is Rodnell Collins' insight about his uncle. Malcolm basically lived two lives. When he was around Ella, he enthusiastic enthusiastically participated in family picnics and family dinners. He saved some of his money to send to his brothers and sisters in Lansing, but in his Detroit Red life, he participated in prostitution, marijuana sales, cocaine sessions, numbers running, the occasional robbery, and apparently paid homosexual encounters. So, that's from um, Manning Maripol's book. And then I have the... Uh, autobiography which has that passage 
um, that they're talking about in here. So it's talking about Rudy's mother was Italian and his father was Negro. He was born right there in Boston, a short little fellow, a pretty boy type. Rudy worked regularly for an employment agency that sent him to wait on tables at exclusive parties. He had a side deal going, a hustle that took me right back to the old steering days in Harlem. Once a week, Rudy went to the home of this old, rich Boston blue blood, pillar of society, pillar of society aristocrat. He paid Rudy to undress them both. And then picked up the old man like a baby, lay him on his bed, and then stand over him and sprinkle him all over with talcum powder. Rudy said that the old man would actually reach his climax from that. Uh, I, being Malcolm X, told him and Shorty about some of the things I seen. Rudy said that as far as he knew, Boston had no organized specialty sex houses. Just individual rich whites who had their private specialty desires catered to by Negroes who came to their homes camouflaged as chauffeurs, maids, waiters, or some other accepted image. Just as in New York, these were the rich, the highest society, the predominantly old men past the age of ability to conduct any kind of ordinary sex, always hunting for new ways to be sensitive. Rudy, I remember, spoke of one old white man who paid a black couple to let him watch them have intercourse on his bed. Another was so sensitive that he paid to sit on a chair outside a room where a couple was. He got his satisfaction just from imagining what was going on on the inside. A good burglary team includes, I knew, what is called a finder. A finder is one who locates lucrative places to rob. Another principal need is to have someone able to case these people's physical layouts to determine means of entry, the best getaway routes, and so forth. Rudy qualified on both uh, both counts. So that's, um, that's the passage out of the autobiography of uh, uh, Malcolm X. It's what uh, Marable Manning, or is what Manning Marable um, is saying is uh, Rudy is actually Malcolm X, or Malcolm X is talking about Rudy, in, uh, uh, when he's talking about Rudy, he's actually talking about himself in the book. So, in 1992, Bruce Perry's biography, uh, Malcolm, The Life of a Man Who Changed Black America, by Station Hill Press, based on 400 interviews, uh, with Malcolm's friends and family members, documented quite a few of the of his same-sex experiences. A schoolmate, Bob BB, recalls the day he and Malcolm stumbled on a local lad jerking off. Um, Malcolm BB recalled ordered the youth to masturbate him, and later boasted that he had given him oral sex as well. Spike Lee's 1992 biopic, Malcolm X, which won the Academy Award nomination for Denzel Washington in the title role, hinted at the fact that from the age of 20 on, Malcolm had sex with men for money. And in Perry's book, two of Malcolm's friends remembered bumping into him at a New York City YMCA where Malcolm bragged that he earned money service in queers, in quotations. Marable Manning declares some individual an alleged murderer, so he actually points out somebody... Um, uh, an, an individual's name who is a murderer who's never been formally accused or convicted of the crime. And a woman mentioned by name is accused of committing adultery 46 years ago. Marable, who died on April 1st, takes cheap shots at Malcolm X, Malcolm's parents, Betty Shabazz, Malcolm's siblings, and almost anyone with a familial nexus to Malcolm X. Elijah seems to know every move I make. Haley quotes him in the epilogue, saying in the final days of his short life, On February 16th, Malcolm X told Haley, I've been marked for death in the next five days. I have the names of five black Muslims who have been chosen to kill me, and I will announce them at the meeting. On February 21st, five black Muslims killed him while his wife and four little girls watched in horror. Black Muslims were threatening to kill him to prevent him from testifying in a Los Angeles paternity case filed against Elijah Muhammad by two of his teenage secretaries. With those kinds of stressors and extramarital affair the night before he died seems highly unlikely, and he certainly would not have chosen a teenage girl at the time when he was scheduled to testify against the black Muslim leader, leader uh, Elijah Muhammad, else for doing the exact same thing. After claiming that Betty Shabazz had an affair with one of Malcolm's assistants guarding his family on page 394. Maribel alleges that Malcolm X pursued yet another extramarital relationship. He also claims that Malcolm met with Alex Haley on February 20th to discuss their joint book project. 
took Betty to a friend's house for her to spend the night and then rented a, rented a cheap hotel where he may have had the teenage secretary as a bed warmer. That's from page two, 423. And uh, that evening, Sharon 6X may have joined him in his hotel room. So Sharon 6X would have been the um, young girl who uh, was in Malcolm X's room, um, allegedly. Later that night, several African-American men entered the Hilton lobby asking for Malcolm's room number. Someone had contacted the hotel's head of security who confronted the men, and then they promptly left. So he was being chased. That was towards the end of his life. There are num numerous published accounts from those close to Malcolm that he was near his breaking point. By then, black Muslims had bombed his home on Valentine's Day because Malcolm refused to move out of the house, pending a judgment over its ownership. Marable claims that the same teenager who was romantically involved with Malcolm the night of February 20th showed up to the Audubon Ballroom the next day. She sat in the front row next to a man whose name would appear in FBI documents relating to the assassination. The teenager, Marable writes in the New Work, New Work, New, New, Newark Mosque official now live together in the same New Jersey residence and Sharon 6X Pool Shabazz has maintained absolute silence about her relationship with both Malcolm X and Linwood X Cathcart, a Nation of Islam goon on page 452. The source given for this allegation is Abdur Rahman Muhammad. So Malcolm X is gay. Uh, at least that's what this book is uh, is alleging. Um, I don't know. It's something to consider as a scientist. You always gotta keep your mind open for any possibility. And the evidence that he's saying is pointing coming straight out of the Malcolm X's autobiography. So could it have been possible that Malcolm X covered up his own crimes by putting it on uh, one of his friends from his Detroit Red days? I think it's possible. Um, I think anything's, you know, most anything's possible, but, I mean, that sounds, uh, back, it seems like homosexuals would have been more oppressed than they are today, so I would have thought, and they're oppressed today, so I would think that somebody, uh, in Malcolm X's shoes wouldn't have brought that out, um, so, so, yeah, that's it, Malcolm X might be gay, Malcolm X might be gay. I'll amend what I said. I don't know if he was totally gay. I'm sure he probably had gay moments. Uh, but he could have actually been with another man. So, Malcolm X, my hero.